Hello everyone, welcome to the 14th episode of the Philip Deterrent podcast where I interviewed Tyler Mayoras, who is a very experienced impact investor who has been in the investing game for a really, really long time. And now he's been focusing all his energy and capital and probably the capital of his partners on building the future of food. And he believes that future is plant based. So in this interview would really di dive deep into uh, why should the future be plant-based and it's not only you know the vegan perspective but also the purely environmental perspective um, and also you know it, his views are not necessarily extreme I, I don't think my views are extreme uh, either on the topic and I do have a lot of uh, opinions on on whether we should be plant-based or not um, so I think it's a really great analysis of how the industry works when can we expect everyone to be plant-based? What kind of impact it will have on the world, uh, on our health and on the environment? Um, and I have to apologize, There's uh, towards the end of the podcast, there's a little bit of lag on, on Tyler's side. It's kind of hard to hear him, but that goes away pretty quickly. So don't worry when you're in that part, you can skip ahead or burn through it. But uh, thank you very much for <laughs> watching or listening to another episode. I really appreciate it. Hope you like it. Um, looking always for some feedback, uh, but yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll see each other soon. So welcome to the podcast. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to come and, and spend this 45 minutes with us. How about you start off and tell us about who you are, what do you do and why you came to talk to me uh, on the show today? Sure. Yeah, so I'm Tyler Mayoris. I spent uh, 25 years or 20 plus years investing in uh, companies, private companies as a private equity investor with a mo big percentage of that time spent on food, food and agriculture. So I was investing and, and leaning more and more towards sustainable food and agriculture. And um, in 20, um, 2020, basically, we launched a company called Cool Beans, which I was one of the co-founders of. And um, when we kind of that started to take off and get into retail distribution and whatnot, I left the private equity firm I was with and came full time focused on Cool Beans. And then I do some advisory work on the side. I still stayed actively involved as an investor. I'm an angel investor. And I also work with a fund called Beyond Impact to invest in companies that are taking animals out of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And so that's, uh, that's kind of what I do. So, um, of course, yeah. go on. Go on. Right. Yeah, and I'm just excited to be here. I, I love what you're doing from a sustainability standpoint. And that's really where my main focus is as an investor. Okay, so there's so much to unpack and I'll start unpacking straight away. So, of course, food is a really, really big deal, right? So without like food is the reason why we have deforestation. Food is the reason why we have used up majority of arable land already on this planet, right? To the point where we, where we have to cut, where we have to cut deforestation. Um, the way that we consume food and the way that the whole food system works it leads to a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the whole, am I correct to say, I don't know if this is in the US or worldwide, that the food market is worth $4 trillion, over $4 trillion? Is, it, is that US or the whole world? That probably makes sense. Yeah, it's some, but somewhere food in general is somewhere around 35, between 35 and 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And some of those, wow. some of that's normal has to happen to feed everybody. But mm -hmm. some of it is disproportionately rigged against the system and causing more just devastation than needs to happen. Now, what's the valuation in, in the U.S.? And just so we put this into yeah, an economic perspective, do you know like the size of the food market globally, or rough? Mm, geez, I don't know. I don't know that number. But you, you're probably right. Four trillion. I mean, it's a it's a very big number for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, it, in the U.S., I think it's somewhere around eighteen percent of all GDP. So that so gives you a it. sense. It's a yeah, it's a big, big market. Yeah, and yeah. probably the most important and, and, and fundamental ones. Like would you would you say, right, food is a more important part of the economy than real estate? In your in your eyes. Oh boy, I mean, look, you can't live without food, right? So certainly, but you also need shelter. So I mean, there's those are two of the big ones for sure. The uh, and then there's also the basically. logistics about being able to get around and get food moved around and get products moved around. Um, those are three big elements and they all have greenhouse gas implications mm -hmm. for the system. Well, po 
point is, right, food is incredibly important, right? Yes. <laughs> but it, it's one of the most important things that happens on this planet is actually food, right? And it, not right. even only for humans, but for every single species that there is. Food is literally what creates life, what continues life, uh, and it's a really, really big deal. So when you commit your career, right, maybe not all of it, but at least recently, right, then looking into the future to changing how we work with food, how we produce food, what kind of food we eat. Why is it that you are you're, you're putting such a focus on it in your eyes and what, why do you want to push it towards plant-based? What's the reason yeah. behind it? Well, I first got involved in food. Um, actually, the very first investment on food I made was in Boca Burger way back when, when they were the only one of the only veggie burgers around. Very different iteration back in the late, uh, 90s. And uh, it was a very successful transaction. So I kind of got the, the bug a little bit then. Um, but over time, I've just gravitated more and more to food. It's it's one of those recession resistant industries that people yes, always I mean. need. And, and it's so fundamental to everything we do. And then as if you look at the health aspects of it, the way that you eat can dramatically impact you know, your longevity, et cetera. No, so, so I was very interested in it and just gradually started moving and, and concentrating all my time on food. And that's the last 12 years of my 20 year plus career were spent on food. And then certainly as a, as an entrepreneur, I've been involved with food, but mm -hmm. from a criticality standpoint, so it's such a big part of the market. You, it's not surprising that if you, I'm not sure if you've heard, heard the book Drawdown by Paul Hawk. And, um, I don't it's know. A great, I don't know it's a great book about what he did was he hired a bunch of fellows and had them research what are the things that we can do to most impact and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and ultimately reduce climate change. And he came up with like 70, a list of 70, and they researched them and they quantified what the value of each of those was. Mm -hmm. And it's, an, it's a great list. It's a great book that everybody should read. But not surprisingly, with food being such a big part of the economy, two of the top five things that we can do to mitigate climate change were, were food-related. Mm -hmm. One was reducing food waste, because about 35% of all food is wasted every year, which is staggering. Mm -hmm. um, and it's wasted in lots of different supply chain areas. But there's things that we can do as, as people to, to reduce that. And then mm -hmm. the second thing is to move toward a plant-based diet. And mm -hmm. that is because animal agriculture contributes of that 35% of all the, basically um, the animal agriculture is about half of that. It's about 60 mm -hmm. to 90% of all greenhouse gases are coming from that. And it's a much more disproportionate amount than vegetables. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because not only it's a really inefficient system, if you think about it, you're not only are you growing the animals to a, to an age when they can be slaughtered and then you're processing them, et cetera, but you have to grow all the food for those animals. And 65% mm -hmm. of the farmland in the United States is used to grow food for animals, mm -hmm. which is nuts. So we talk about food security issues and we talk about um, you know, not having enough food for people. Well, we have plenty of land to grow enough food for people. It's just we're mm -hmm. feeding animals right now. To mm -hmm. eat. And, and frankly, the U.S. is the, the worst contributor. I mean, we mm -hmm. by far, if the rest of the world ate food at the rate that the U.S. eats meat, I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, eats meat at the rate that meat and dairy, um, we would need four worlds to grow all the food for those animals. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. ridiculous, really. And so we, as the United States, have to be the leaders of that change because mm -hmm. we're the worst offenders. That's actually kind of mind blowing to, to say that you you if everybody would have a U.S. diet, you need four Earths to to manage it. Yeah, so thank God that we don't, and, and hopefully we can catch other countries, keep them where they are while the U.S. brings itself down. Yeah. Okay. So loads to unpack here again, right? So yes. let, let's talk about let's talk about why what you just said is true, right? Why is it that? Rather than eating uh, meat, if you go straight to eating plants, you will save on greenhouse gases. And the one thing that's really obvious, I think like uh, anybody can, can understand this logic is that you're basically removing the middleman, right? So you're removing, rather than going, oh, crop, 
feeding a cow or chicken and then you know that cow or chicken takes well longer to grow than you know most plants you know uh I, right. although there's some like really scary things about how quickly we kill uh, cows for example like did you know and uh, that most male calves i think that are butchered around the age of two which is like they're still at a very young yeah, stage so of young. their life right yeah yeah right. so although we it's really sad to uh to to think about but although that we we um rather than taking the the energy or the or the calories right from its source we pass it through a medium which changes the calories right it makes them different um and then it's fed back to us so let's really analyze this equation and i want to i want to hear your thoughts yeah. when it what is the value added right um uh, taste would be one of them by having that middleman Let, let's take for example a cow from a nutritious from a nutritious perspective how much do you actually gain with that investment of time and resources to uh well, you to actually grow lose. a cow you, you don't gain you lose so in fact um the statistic i've heard and i i've not verified this stat i've verified the greenhouse gas stat i've built it up myself yes. using usda data but the, the fact i've heard is that it takes 16 calories to of food to grow one calorie of food from an animal from meat from mm -hmm. beef mm -hmm. and so in essence you're losing a dramatic calories. you're losing 16 mm -hmm. times your food mm -hmm. so if you just ate the carrot you know it would be one to one but when you mm -hmm. use meat it's you know it's one to 16. so it's, it's but inefficiency mm -hmm. But we're talking calories, right? But what about calories. other nutritious uh, ingredients? Like, for example, proteins. Like, I think that would be the main argument made. You, you have a, yeah. a steak or a chicken fillet. It's going to probably have more protein than a potato, right? So what is it? So are we trading? And I'm, I'm not saying this is a useful trade. I agree. I mean, it's very hard to argue that, it, that it's a useful trade at the end of the day, yeah. right? It's it, it was a useful trade for as long as we could do it when you had no environmental impact. If you didn't care right. about animal suffering, sure, it maybe it was a nice trade because it, it tastes better to a lot of people. It has more proteins, but overall, right, when it, when we take taste of the equation, right, and you go new, new, on the nutrition end in general, what is a, what are really the trade-offs? Uh, is there any benefits to having a, meat uh, n n nutrients from meat over over vegetables is there any uh, nutritious value uh, gained by by meat uh well certainly meat has a lot of protein um but you could get pr plenty of protein from plants so mm -hmm. actually per calorie i believe beans have higher protein than than meat or chicken um and the, the real critical difference is that plants all have fiber and animal pro foods have zero fiber. Mm -hmm. So if you think about your gut health, your gut survives on fiber, your mm -hmm. the good bacteria in your gut. And those live in the lower intestine and your colon, etc. And so you have to get undigested food down to those areas to get the good fiber to get tree, feed the good bacteria. Um, unfortunately, if you're doing a keto or a heavy meat diet, you're getting a you're not you're not getting the, any fiber or very mm -hmm. little fiber, and so you're not you're getting a different host of bacteria that are what I would term kind of the bad gut bacteria, mm -hmm. and um, the good bacteria are what fight your immune system. They they form fuel your immune system because all of your immunity is is centered in your gut. That's where. Mm -hmm. You fight disease, you fight cancer, et cetera. And then it also um, is your mental health. 90% mm -hmm. of your serotonin is um, developed in the gut lining of your uh, lower intestines, et cetera. And then it's also what you crave to eat. So when you mm -hmm. start to transition to a plant-based diet, you start to crave more mm -hmm. vegetables and, and beans, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. You no longer cr crave the meats and et cetera. So that's really the critical thing that's missing from, from a meat diet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, if you're eating um, very clean, non-CAFO meat, it's certainly probably more nutritious than eating CAFO meat, mm -hmm. but it's, it's still not getting you any of the fiber that you're going to be need from vegetables. So that's, that's critical. And, and the other thing about that, that's a lot of keto folks and, 
point to eating grass fed as the alternative. The problem with that is we can't actually do that for most people in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. not enough grassland to feed all those animals. And so mm -hmm. um, we are, as long as people are eating meat, we are stuck with the capo system to, mm -hmm. to, to process a lot of meat through that system. Mm -hmm. That's the contained ag um, contained agriculture system. That's farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 how most people cattle and you know thousands of cattle um, all stuck in one little contained area, and that's unfortunately how they have to do it because we don't we can't we don't have enough grassland to feed everybody on a grass fed diet. That's for sure. And do you believe in a do you believe in like a, a more limited grass fed future for some animals and being st then still being used for meat? Do, what do you think of that? What do you think of grass fed? And I'm not saying grass fed. I know we don't have the space, but if we were to transition mostly to plant based, what is your opinion of, on keeping um, some meat grass fed and in the in the supply chain? Well, I think it's unrealistic to think everybody's going to convert to a plant-based diet. I mean, it's beneficial yeah, for the for the, the planet, and it's also ben beneficial for their health. Health, but not everybody's going to do it. So, mm -hmm. um, I do believe that there should be kind of this grass-fed movement toward regenerative agriculture. I'm, I'm supportive of that, mm -hmm. um, but I think ultimately, more and more people need to move away from. Uh, animals if we're going to actually make a dent in the greenhouse gas emissions and mm -hmm. so you know if we could if we could get 30 to 40 percent of people eating mostly plants or all plants that would be mm -hmm. huge and, and what's uh, mostly the, what do you what do you quantify as mostly to be specific what would be a good benchmark you know i would say nine, i would say people from a health standpoint you should probably shoot to try to be 90 percent plants nice nice i think that's a that's a that's a good ambition. Um, okay, so tell me now, when it comes to types of meat, do you see them all as equally harmful for the environment, or what are or are some better than others? What, what's your take on this? Well, certainly the worst is well, I guess the, the actual worst is supposedly lamb. That's from a from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, and then beefs number two. Those are the worst, um, and then going down the system seafood would be the lowest uh, impact on climate and chicken would be somewhere above that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so certainly chicken is better for the environment, mm -hmm. but I don't know. And I, I guess from a health standpoint, white meat is better than red meat, but um, one has to wonder, I think there's, there's so many birds thrown into one little area and the the disease that's involved there mm -hmm. is is a little scary to me that that isn't i i don't i don't not sure that that's actually better for you given yeah. the potential for disease i think it's a it's very high risk you know um yes, for, I, for I, I sure them. they're disgusting mm -hmm. and so, yeah uh, geez. And, and also <laughs> upset, upsetting to even to, to even think yes. about but a, an argument that would come up having this discussion would be with plant-based foods a lot of these are new technologies especially plant-based meat right so i'm not talking about beans beans are, beans are not the new technology i mean beans have been around right. for a long long time before humans right <laughs> but when it comes to plant-based meat alternatives right and i eat actually quite a few of them and they're actually very nice right uh, there's huera yeah. or huera that we have here in, uh, in barcelona uh, don't you think that the same risk involved in the kind of non-natural way that we manage factory farms. Um, don't you think some of the same problems could arise when we do chemical farms of of of, uh, of meat of, of plant-based meat? Do you do you see that as a potential issue or like a risk factor or something that you consider? What's your thoughts on it? Not not so much a risk factor. I think that um, certainly you prefer to eat less processed food minimally yes. processed from whole food ingredients that's that's the mm -hmm. that's the pinnacle that's where you want to head uh, um head to however um there, there's very little risk from a toxin standpoint and things like that from making 
plant-based foods. In essence, it's mm -hmm. just food processing. Um, what, what's different about it than the animal side of things <clears throat> is all the feces and blood and guts and things like that that are involved in the mm -hmm. whole raising and slaughter of animals that you can't get out of the picture. And those mm -hmm. are that's where the listeria comes from and the outbreaks of you know some of these bird flus mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, what I think is really encouraging, and I first wrote a paper about it about three years ago, and it was not a trend yet, but it was kind of an aspirational trend, mm -hmm. is a move to clean label in the plant-based space. And now mm -hmm. we're seeing it finally, and it's really coming on strong, which is great. So we started Cool Beans, which again, our product is just beans, veggies, whole grains, and spices. So very mm -hmm. clean, it's label, and it's just whole food ingredients. But we started because of this backlash and look going through the grocery store and saying, why are so many of these plant-based foods really processed? Especially at a time when the rest of the industry is going to clean label. Mm -hmm. And now, finally, three years later, we are starting to see other products come out. There's a company called mm -hmm. Actual Veggies, um, which makes basically cuts up veggies and creates patties from that um, mm -hmm. to make burgers that are basically vegetables, actual mm -hmm. uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. There's another company that um, the, the fund that I'm involved with Beyond Impact just invested in called Nowadays. And mm -hmm. Nowadays is fascinating because it's, it's an extruded product using pea protein, but unlike all the stuff before it, which typically has high in saturated fat because they're trying to mimic meat um, mm -hmm. and a lot of different ingredients, many that are scary looking that you can't pronounce, <laughs> now, nowadays it has seven ingredients, mm -hmm. has zero saturated fat, has five grams of fiber and 13 grams of protein. And so mm -hmm. you're looking at that, you're saying, well, that's an amazing nutritional label. Yes. And mm -hmm. yet it's a, you know, it's theoretically a processed food, but a very clean label processed food. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think the lesson from that is to really not generalize, right? But uh, <laughs> it's, it's it's generally difficult to not generalize. I I think everybody <laughs> everybody everybody generalizes, and uh, although I always tell myself generalization is uh, not an intelligent way of thinking, it, it's a lazy way of thinking. It's an intellectual right. laziness. It's still very useful, you know, to to generalize. And I think a lot of people, uh, when you don't have the time to really learn about a subject, having the generalization is let's say a safer thing to do. Than not having a, and then not having an opinion at all, and I think it's very natural and, and human nature. But I think from what you're saying, uh, is to really look at like all sides of, of an argument, all sides of a of a new technology and, and of a new product, and don't treat processed foods as all evil uh, or all plant based foods as all uh, good, you know, or just to generally have a case by case analysis of what it is that you're eating. Would you agree yeah. with that? I, I would agree with that and, and read the label. You know, I think that just like people are doing in the rest of the store, I was an early investor in Simple Mills and mm -hmm. Simple Mills whole reason for being was to create, take many of the products that have existed forever, like baking mixes mm -hmm. and crackers and whatnot, and create a very clean ingredient um, product alternative. And mm -hmm. usually they had seven to nine or seven to 10 ingredients mm -hmm. and great nutritional label. Mm -hmm. The whole key is you've got to read the labels and then you find this out and you say, oh, this is a great product. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you still, there's processing to make a cracker, right? But if mm -hmm. it's clean ingredient and clean label, then that's processing you don't mind about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Same things now happening in plant-based and I'm really excited about the trend. That's amazing. Now. I want to change our main focus uh, of sure. what we're talking about a little bit. I want to talk about uh, economics. I want to talk about investing. I want to talk about the change of uh, of this whole uh, global food system, right? Which you know a lot about, which you're very well involved in. So plant-based foods, um, vegetarianism, veganism has not started a year or two years ago. It has been around for a really long time, right? Mm, and yes. For, for a long time, I don't think there was a, an, 
a big environmental incentive in it. It was more like for the sake of uh, of health, for the sake of uh, animal rights, things like this. And only since, let's say, climate change became mainstream, our sustainability yes. became mainstream, there became a, a lot of people that understood the, the value of, of a plant-based diet from an environmental perspective, shifted their focus to communicate uh, about the value of plant-based when it comes to the environment, right? So tell me, how has the changes um, in the rate, let's say the rate of change of the old food system to the new one, how has it changed in recent years? Has it accelerated? Have yeah. you seen things changing faster? What, what's your take? Yeah, very good question. So I actually would say that there's two key um, events that are have driven what's happening in plant-based. Um, number one started in 2005 with the publishing of the China study by T. Colin Campbell. And what he did in, the, in that study was he looked at China, which is this really interesting place where they had kept data on um, um, cancer rates for a long period of time. And people mm -hmm. are very separated. It's a huge continent. And they eat very different diets around, around that country. And so you had big cities like um, uh, uh, Shanghai and whatnot that had very that had kind of camp where they ate a lot of Western diet and they ate cancer rates that were similar to the West. And then you mm -hmm. had other places of the country that ate just predominantly plants and they had very low cancer rates. So he did this huge study on this and he found a huge correlation between mm -hmm. what the plant-based diet and the low cancer rates. And mm -hmm. so then a lot more studies came out as a result of that. And that's what's really driven the health side of, of moving toward a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, or, or, or probably about seven to eight years later, people started, climate change became much more of a mainstream thought and people started doing more studies about what was causing, where, where, where were the drivers of greenhouse gas? And that's when the animal um, agriculture impact really started to surface. I, I found out about it in 2016, but I would say sometime in the in the three to four years before that, people were, it was starting to become a ground groundswell. And so that's driven a lot of people. So now if you looked at, if you looked at veganism in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties, it was always around 1% of the population. Um, and then since 2005, it started to grow. And really, in the last four years, it's exploded. And now in the U.S., there's about 6% of the population identifies as vegan, mm -hmm. which is up dramatically from that historic rate. And if you looked at um, um, Gen Z, they're closer to 10%. And so the, mm -hmm. the increase, and we're going to see a much bigger increase because Generation Z in general is much more focused on climate. And they're mm -hmm. focused on changing things, their behavior. So we are mm -hmm. seeing an explosion as a result. And what I like is the fact that we're now getting this clean label part will bring more people over because there are a lot of people mm -hmm. who are hesitant because of the processed food nature of it. They wouldn't eat a Beyond Burger or whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now that you get this very clean nutritional label, um, suddenly I think we're going to see an even more explosion. That's amazing. And I, I think this is where Cool Beans uh, fits really well. Uh, what really attracted me to Cool Beans when I learned about the from you, I, all, all the work that you guys are doing, is that there's no um, like fake meat alternative. There's no processing. It's, a, it's literally just a delicious setup, you know, using using plants, right? And I love yeah. beans. Be beans are delicious. Beans have a lot of, a lot of protein. And I really have um, a lot of faith in a gradual transition to a more, let's say, a more plant-based focused diet. Like I would believe in something like a 99, like what you said, 90% what you eat is, is veg and, and fruit and, and, and the various uh, other carbohydrates and only about 10% or less is some kind of meat, preferably the best kind of meat, like whether that's fish or chicken and no beef. I think we could definitely remove beef completely, right? Like right. talking like from a really realistic point of view, right? I have been 
I also from my from my experience a little bit right now i would consider myself a flexitarian i've been fully vegetarian for something like six months uh, but because of the fact that it was very difficult for me to include in my diet also with my girlfriend who, uh, who who cooks for me and for her as well to include some kind of protein that is um easy to access which is not uh some kind of processed plant-based thing like well, obviously we, we eat be we eat beans right beans would be like yeah. our main plant-based option but having the ability or like allowing myself or, or our, ourselves to eat occasionally some chicken or some fish makes it extremely easy to to have like a 90 percent uh plant-based system right. because then you always have that ability to oh uh, i can although you can't eat meat majority of the time you can always think you know what i'll be able to eat meat in like 10 days you know what i mean and, like chicken and i think that's a very much more realistic sell right to the to the population then go and just completely oh extremism no meat at all you know get rid of the get rid of it from the system and i i have a lot of faith that we will be able to uh progress in the, in that sense now when you talk about gen z right and i think that's extremely interesting so there's gen z and then there's gen alpha right so that that's really that's going to be the next one so do you think that when generation <clears throat> alpha arrives in their at the point when they're 25 to 30 where they become fully financially independent do you have any projections and this could be a range or an estimate what kind of uh, what type of fraction percentage of the population in the us would be either let's say fully vegetarian slash vegan or 90 percent plant-based where do you think it's going to be like a, a business yeah. investment estimation well, I do believe that the percentage of people identifying as vegan, um, at least from a dietary perspective, because, you know, true vegans also won't wear leather and, and a lot of different things. And but I think from a dietary perspective, the people that are identifying as vegan will grow dramatically um, because of that three legged stool, because it's climate, it's health and it's now the animals. Yes. Um, mm -hmm as well as environment too, it's almost four because what happens with our waterways and the pollution uh, from animal agriculture is pretty dramatic and pretty horrendous really. Um, but so I don't know that I could give you an exact percentage, but would I be surprised at all if 15 to 20% of the population was vegan in 15 years? Not at all. I think that's very realistic and doable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you're still going to have a lot of flexitarians. Um, something something like 80% of people right now are trying to reduce their meat consumption. So we yeah. have a lot of flexitarians. That's the biggest part of the mm -hmm. population, frankly, yes, definitely. that mm -hmm. are reducing. Um, and that's great. And we cater to those folks. And we, I mean, our whole thing at Cool Beans, you know, we mix these things together with really great spices and but it's, it's beans and veggies, but you eat it. And it, our whole thing is it tastes so good. You don't know you're eating plants. That's really what uh -huh. we're about. It just, mm -hmm. we just don't have a meat alternative. We don't have a fake meat or a fake cheese in them. We just use mm -hmm. plants and spices that bring the flavor. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see a lot more, a much higher percentage. Uh, if Gen Z is any reflection of the future, I, I think it easily could be above 10% and hopefully a lot more. That's incredible. I, I really, I, w I would say that flex. If I was to give you my estimation, by twenty thirty, when you look at Gen Z and you look at Gen Alpha, um, so that's actually not that long. That's just eight years. Even by then, yeah. I would imagine that majority of people that are between the ages of eighteen and thirty, so that would be probably a combination of Gen Alpha and Gen, and Gen Z. I would say probably around half would be flexitarian at least. I would pro oh, I would yeah. say at least half, and if if not more, because on t the the other compounding effect, the the number one marketer for anything that's sustainability related is actually climate change and the consequences of climate change. Right. And I think with news and social media, and you just see like for example, we've had a war or we still have a war in Russia Ukraine, and with social media, look how quickly that became like the topic of the whole world. Like 20, mm -hmm. 30 years ago, in, in countries where there was no social media, wars could happen and nobody would know and nobody would start right. to care right so i really think that social media is like a big uh, amplifier of like human consciousness Absolutely. and and Absolutely. i really think that i really think that with the with the impact of of 
climate change, like negative consequences, I think it will consistently amplify and get people to switch. So I'm very hopeful and very positive uh, about this. And I really, I, I have a very optimistic yeah. outlook on it. I, I agree. And, and if you look at Gen Z, the, uh, what, what's, what's amazing and, and encouraging to me is they don't do, an average Gen Z does not do anything, buy anything without thinking about the climate impact of what they're buying. Whether it's you know avoiding plastic bottles or thrifting clothes or moving toward a plant-based diet, they're just very on top of it in, in everything mm -hmm. that they do. And there's no reason to believe Gen Alpha is gonna be any less. I think there'll be more probably because mm -hmm. it's even yeah. a bigger focus for them, right? And mm -hmm. so I, I, I'm very encouraged by that. And, and yes, social media amplifies that so that the message, I mean, Greta, and her movement exists mm -hmm. because of social media, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I don't know if you know, but I'm actually Gen Z. <laughs> I'm a, I'm yeah, I, I figured you might yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Both of my daughters, dad, I recently talking. read a great book <laughs> mm -hmm. um, called Generation We, The Promise, Power and Promise of Generation Z. Yeah. And it's by a woman here in Chicago, actually. And I highly recommend that you can grab it on Amazon. But I, I bought it because I've got two Gen Z daughters and I wanted to understand them better. And as I read that book, I realized, holy cow, every business person in America should read this book because they're going to be 20. You guys are going to be 20, something like 27 or 28 percent of the buying power in seven years. Or so. And mm -hmm. you think completely different than every generation before you, whether it's about gender um, issues whether it's about racial equality, climate, mm -hmm. communication, uh, it's just a very different way. And if you're going to sell anything in this world that involves consumers, you better understand where the consumer is going to be in seven years. Definitely. I think, and uh, I always think about this <laughs> and I try to tell my older coworkers sometimes, I don't, I don't, I don't know if they get it, but I think the biggest advantage of being a Gen Z is the fact that from a early adolescence, we had access, right? And the access could be negative or positive to infinite information, right? Like we, we grew up with YouTube, you know, like YouTube was something that I grew up with as a, as a teenager. I always had access to YouTube. And when you look at YouTube today, YouTube is like better than any school or any college. It has infinite information, right? And oh, of course yeah. it has loads of more information. Yeah, but you can literally learn anything. Like you have colleges are gonna, come on, I come on to YouTube, right? Because they see that this is really uh, the future of, of sharing information. And the fact that we have this, and for example, when we compare to your generation, obviously when you were a teenager, it was before the internet, right? So yeah. you, you, didn't, you didn't have, um, you didn't have a, an ability to go straight to source uh, of information. There's always you a bit of encyclopedias crazy yes yeah yeah and there was and you the amount of volume you could you could take in of information would have obviously been been lower right so i really yeah. think that this is technology so we have well, this like well extra the layer communication you know? piece of it the communication piece is really fascinating to me because you're the first generation that's grown up with a smartphone in your hand exactly and that's what i mean mm -hmm. most like, like we're doing this and you're in barcelona and i'm in chicago that wouldn't yeah. have existed it's crazy. 10 years ago <laughs> And, and friends, people, Gen Z will have friends halfway around the world that are their best friend. And mm -hmm. yeah, they don't see them in person often or ever, but they have conversation with the people every day. That's a whole new way of thinking that is, um, it's, it's just going to accelerate from here. And I think that, that that's potential for a global identity, right? I mean, that's a, that's like, a wet dream for me that's like as, as good as it gets you know like for yeah. humanity to have a, a global identity it would solve such a massive number of problems sometimes you know i still question myself whether it's possible or not but what you just said i think really um uh, really plays into that because that's another thing that i think people my age would really not appreciate is the fact that it was extremely difficult to have a relationship with someone who does not speak your language or doesn't live where you live. You know, it was, it was right. even learning languages was so much more difficult, right? Because there was so much less information. Like you didn't have Duolingo, you, you didn't have 
like yeah. tons and tons of content, you know? So that's another thing that I think really is bringing the world together. They're translating. You know? I mean, now there's translating software, you know, for older people, they don't even have to learn yeah. the language. They could, they you have Google Translate. translate. Real yeah. time, yeah, real time yeah. in a conversation. This is new. This is yeah. brand new. So I think this is amazing. And um, so, wow, well, we got so much stuff to talk about. I have made a mistake in, uh, for this podcast because I did not charge my iPad enough. I'm literally just went to 1%, right? So <laughs> we're in high risk, we're in high risk territory now, but we need yes, right. to to 45 for minutes. Sure. So if you were to leave us, and of course we can do this again in a couple of months. I had a great yeah. time. There's things I didn't even touch on that I wanted to touch on. We didn't have enough time because there's so many tangents. So tell me if you want to leave the audience with one thing, what would you leave? Well, what, what would you like to communicate um, to let them off of this interview? You know, I would say that um, there are a few things that you can do to really impact climate that not everybody knows about. One of those is to buy upcycled food, which reduces food waste. So buy mm -hmm. products that have been upcycled from other products. Um, buy, uh, the second thing would be to compost all your post-consumer food waste. So, um, just, you can get, you can get a service that will do it, or you can do it yourself, but compost that so that it becomes fertilizer that then can be used by farmers rather than creating fertilizer, which is very carbon intensive. And then the mm -hmm. third one we talked about during this whole program, which is move to a plant-based diet. It's going to be better for you and it's going to be better for the planet. Amazing stuff. So Tyler, thank you very much. I really enjoyed Thanks it here because it really puts it. down. Maybe you'll delete it. So ciao. It's been it's been a pleasure, and we'll we'll chat soon. Okay. I'll Sounds good. Thanks so. much. Okay. Thank you, Tyler. Bye bye. Thank you.